Okay. So, welcome everybody. We're excited to have Anthony and Melissa Medina on the call. My husband's away. He's down the shore, so I'm here in Basking Ridge. He's down the Jersey Shore, and Melissa and Anthony are in Texas. Um, I'm really excited. This is such a timely time to have this type of a, a Zoom call based, you know, on everything that's happening right now. We, the Lord knows we need to know how to tap into the Lord. But before I do that, I just want to give a little background of your, you know, little bio information here. Um, so I'm going to read it, okay? So Melissa Medina. His heart is to help uh, people align with truth, awaken to purpose, and advance the kingdom in every sphere. She's a vibrant communicator, passionate about equipping and activating others in the area of prayer and prophecy to transform hearts and the world around them. Melissa has two decades of um, in church leadership roles in executive le level kingdom administration. Through these strategic assignments, she helped birth and steward apostolic mandates and prophetic intercessor intercessory initiatives along key national leaders such as Cindy Jacobs, Dutch Sheets, and Lou Ingalls. Melissa and her husband, Anthony, share a passion to fuel revival, lifestyles, and societal reformation. They travel and speak under the banner of Hope Fires International, uh, their itinerant ministry devoted to igniting hope, healing, and spiritual hunger. They help launch, launch a school of supernatural ministry, discipling students to receive and release the kingdom everywhere they go. Melissa and Anthony are currently lead and equip believers on a broader scale as pastors of prayer and prophetic ministries for Ch uh, Trinity Church. So we are so happy to have you guys on. And... Um, you know, we know that the foundation of, of anything that we do in church life is prayer, and it's prophetic intercession, and I know that's your passion. And I think it's really important that um, my husband and you, Anthony, were on because, you know, God has called men and women to pray. And a lot of times, you know, in a lot of these meetings and when we're, when we're even on prayer journeys or things that we're doing, there's more women than men. But I really see that the Lord is shifting things and really raising up the men. Because, listen, yeah. we all need each other. And, and what I have, my husband doesn't have and vice versa. So we need, and it's very complimentary, but it's, it's just men and women to, to be in this prayer army, this powerful prayer army that I believe that, you know, it's our finest hour. And that... As we decree that thing, it shall be established. And understanding that prophetic anointing that we have, the prophetic intercessory anointing, that creates breakthrough and shifts things. We have uh, right now, like we had just gotten word that uh, in our area um, they're planning riots and um, you know to come and, and, and try to wreak havoc. Now they're they're also planning on peaceful um, protesting, which is fine but not when you're coming in to wreak havoc. And there's been a lot of threats here, just like all over. So we as the Ecclesia have that power and authority to pray and, and really put a halt in the realm of the Spirit. So, you know, this is your thing, and, and you teach prayer at church and at Trinity Church in Cedar Hill, Texas. And so why don't you just share your heart a little bit about um, what's on your heart regarding prophetic intercession, because it's really important that we know who we are and we know how to tap into the heart of God. Okay. Um, well, when we, when we engage in, in prayer, you know, the most important thing for us to do is really to pray um, according to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. You know, a lot of us get frustrated because we don't see answers to our prayers, or sometimes because we feel like we don't have direction in prayer, we don't know how to pray um, into a certain situation. And really the answer is for us to pray according to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Um, you know, scriptures tell us that we don't know what to pray. We don't mm -hmm. know how we ought to pray, but it's the Holy Spirit that helps us in that area of weakness. And he prays through us. If we allow him, if we invite him in, he prays through us, right? With groanings that we, we can't express. So when we make room for the Holy Spirit in our prayer life, Holy Spirit, he, he is the helper. He is the paraclete, paraclete the paracletos, which the, the paracletos is like, you know, paraclete. It's like he comes up under us. He's the one who comes up under us to help us and to support us in our prayer life. 
Amen. And um, and he reveals the heart of God to us so that we can actually pray out the will of God. And so when we make room for the Holy Spirit in that way, it says that he he um, hears. He has this ministry of hearing where he actually listens, this ministry of listening. He listens for what the Father is speaking. He listens for what Jesus is speaking. And then he reveals those things to us. And when we invite Holy Spirit into our prayer life, we're making room for revelation to come by the Holy Spirit so that we can pray according to the will of God. He is our helper. He is our paraclete. He, make, he is available to us. And so often we forget the role of the Holy Spirit in prayer. And that's, and you know, and we pray according to our intellect or we pray according to our understanding, our limited understanding of the situations that are going on around us. We pray according to our, our earthly perspective of what's happening instead of praying from that higher perspective. We are told that we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. Mm -hmm. So engaging in prophetic intercession is very much a matter of number one, positional authority where we are praying from that higher place, where we're praying from that place where we're seated with Christ in heavenly places and we're seeing things from the perspective of heaven. Right. We're seeing things from, from heaven's viewpoint, not from our earthly viewpoint. We're seeing things according to God's intended end for a situation, right? right. He sees every he sees everything from the from the end to the beginning. Mm -hmm. And we can see God's intended end and his intended outcome in a situation. And then we can back track and pray uh, to fulfill his will in that situation and 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 our guidance our leadership into that is by the holy spirit yeah. where he teaches us he is our helper sent to teach us all things and even to bring to remembrance the things that god speaks to us so holy mm -hmm. spirit is is really our helper in the place of prayer and that's that's how we transition from praying in our own strength and praying in our own understanding to actually prophetic intercession where we involve the Holy Spirit in right. our prayer and we're fully dependent and yielded to the Holy Spirit to right. lead us and guide us in a revelation of what the will of God is. So then truly we're praying according to how Jesus instructed us to pray, which is your kingdom come Amen. and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We can pray that because we've prayed from that heavenly seat, from that heavenly position of authority. And we can pray that because we know what the will of God is because Holy Spirit has revealed it to us. That's right. So we pray with authority, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth according as it is in heaven, according to the things that have been revealed to us in heaven. It's like there are all these heavenly realities that exist, right? God's God, he already has determined the end from the beginning. So there are these heavenly realities that exist. And so now when we allow Holy Spirit to reveal to us the will of God, we, we come into an awareness of the heavenly realities, right? And we can lay hold of them and then we can bring them into the earth realm. We pray them out in the earth realm so that they are made manifest. They're made real in the earth realm. And I think that's the difference between when we're, when we're just praying in our own strength and we're just striving um, and, and doing it in our own understanding. And then we're frustrated because we don't see answers to prayer right. to actually just resting, right. resting in the victory of Jesus, the victory that we already have in every situation and resting in his goodness and the goodness in that the gift of the Holy Spirit that he's given us to guide us in our prayer life. Amen. Uh, That's awesome. You know, on the, from the standpoint of men, um, when I'm, when I'm working with men to teach them about prayer, I don't even start with prayer. You know, men, we can be a little uh, short-tempered and a little stubborn sometimes, a little hard of hearing, or well, it's just kind of the same thing in the spirit, you know? So I don't, I don't even go touch the topic of prophetic intercession or anything like that, prophecy. I, I go directly for teaching them uh, to hear the voice of God, you know, and just really posturing their heart in a place of stillness and a place of silence to hear that voice. Because once they hear his voice, and they recognize his voice, then they're, I mean, they're going to pray because they're going to do whatever yeah. the father's asking them to do. So if I can get them to just hear the voice, they're going to yeah. pray, they're going to intercede, they're going to prophesy. But for men, I just find just getting them to that place of hearing clearly first, and then everything else kind of falls in line. For them. So yeah, that's, that's a great good. point because I think we tend to be very results oriented mm -hmm. because we're trained to do that, you know, and the way we're groomed. And if, if there's unbelief in our heart and we don't see results right away, we probably have a shorter fuse than 
women do. Uh, and partly, I think we're distracted easily because of work and the other things. So I agree with you 100%, because once you heard the voice of God, and once you feel that confirmation, you don't want to go a day. You know, you, you would really miss stopping and praying and asking, because that's another problem for men is that they, it's a joke, right? We don't ask for directions in the car. Right? <laughs> we think it's a sign of weakness if we have to ask for help. And we really have to break that stronghold of self-reliance. It's not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength to be patient and to wait until you hear from the Lord. And that's I've said to my congregation a hundred times, Tricia taught me that by observation, because I saw how different her decision-making process was when we first got married. She was taking a whole lot longer to pray before making a decision. And I was just way too fast. I hadn't really learn to be patient about it and the business world is very fast time is money you have to decide but that's a joke really because if you have if you have the confidence to know that god's going to speak to you you can wait and who's ever waiting for your answer just say i need to sleep on it right and most of the time that's fine i also just uh, want you to give a little background because i know you were with some of our friends on your way up as you were learning about this whole topic with Cindy Jacobs and Dutch Sheets. And, you know, those are some amazing mentors that you had. Some things you can learn out of a book, but then other things you catch along the way and you receive an impartation. We were speaking with Cheon last night and his impartation also from Peter Wagner and so many of the other kind of amazing people he was with. And I'm just curious, you know, if you could give a little background on that because I'm sure that helped keep the fire burning for you. and. I know that they kept you on your toes because they are, they are intense people that want they want to get things done. Um, well, um, with regard to intercessory prayer, is that what you're asking? Yeah, because you were with Dutch uh, when he was yes. teaching a lot of that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I I did work for um, worked alongside Cindy Jacobs for a total of seven years wow. um, with her national. Um, uh, Reformation Prayer Network, and um, and then two years prior to that, just assisted with a lot of other things in the ministry, and then had the honor also of working for Dutch Sheets for many years um, as um, his executive assistant, and assisted with you know birthing some different projects and initiatives, and some some of his publications and things like that. Um, and you know, you said something very very important that there's a difference between like the book knowledge, and then there's um, right. There's actually living it out, right? right. And um, you know, and I've I've worked for these generals in in the prayer movement, and even Luangle and some others, and you know, and and very often, you know, it's all of these coming under their mentorship and coming under their um, their leadership, and um, even praying like at the national level, right? And mm -hmm. praying concerning national issues and interceding and learning to see, you know, answers to prayer and things shift and, um, you know, how to deal with this giant in society and that giant and, um, and different strongholds. And, um, and all of that was exciting, <laughs> exhilarating. I wouldn't exchange any of it, mm -hmm. you know, for one moment. I mean, it was, it, it really has been the greatest gift to me and, and really it, mm -hmm. You know, it, it was um, that journey that the Lord led me on came out of a major shift in my life because I was headed on this road toward um, law school. I just always wanted to be an attorney. And I was actually in, um, you know, both a master's and, and, and a law degree at New York University and, you know, New York City. That's where we're originally from. And, um, and there came a time where I was just so hungry for the Lord and just going after God with everything. And I started shifting and, and my education, my career had actually become like an idol in my life. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't, even though I grew up in the church, my dad was a pastor, but I had made that an idol in my life. And I was doing all the stuff in the church and doing all of the religious activity, you know, doing all the stuff, but my, my career goals had become an idol. And then there came this time where we were going through a real hard time through a lot of shakings in the church and, and, and it broke me. I mean, it broke me. And thankfully, you know, in those kind of situations, sometimes people kind of veer away from the Lord, right. but thankfully in that time, the Lord just threw me to his heart. He wooed me and, and I just followed the Lord into this place of seeking him in intimacy. And I went from spending you know, 18 hours a day in school and in my studies and in my notes and all of that to, you know, to spending just a few hours 
uh, still doing great in, in, in my studies, just a few hours in my studies, but I'd be up all night in prayer. I'd be up all night just worshiping and in the word and in the presence of the Lord. And in that season of hunger, I, I heard the Lord at one time, at one time, he, he didn't, it, he didn't demand it. He didn't command this. It was a very gentle invitation where he said, will you lay down law school? I'm calling you to legislate through prayer. Amen. Amen. And I, I, I grew up in the church. So of course, prayer, I understood, I thought, you know, I understood prayer, um, the fullness of what prayer is. Right. And then I, I was from the age of 16, I worked for judges and attorneys, um, in, in New York city, like as internships, as summer, summer jobs, that's, you know, I was pre-law high school and college, all of it. Um, and then I was on this track for, you know, law degree and, and, and my master's degree. And in the middle of that, I, but I had come to a place where in my brokenness, I had encountered the Lord in such a precious way. He rescued me out of the anger and truthfully, the hate and the bitterness that I had in my heart because of hurt church, a uh, church hurt yeah. and all that disappointment and betrayal and all of that, that I was experiencing in the church. He met me there. He loved on me. He healed my heart. And, and when he extended that invitation to me, there was no hesitation on my heart. Mm -hmm. It was like the thing that I for all of my life, the thing that I held in highest esteem, the thing that I wanted the most, the thing I was going after the most with this legal career and all of these goals that I had, all of a sudden it was like that paled in comparison to Jesus. Amen. It paled in comparison to this, 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 this man that loved me in the ugliest, when my heart was so ugly, when my, I mean, and he rescued me out of that condition out of the depression that I was in and he rescued me and he healed me and there was no hesitation where I just said yes to the Lord mm -hmm. and I said I will follow you anywhere I will do what you want and legislate through prayer I don't know what that means I know legislate <laughs> from you know the legal side and I know I think I know prayer but I had never heard those two terms together mm -hmm. so I gave the Lord my yes and that set us on this journey to just seeking the Lord for, okay, how do I transition? How do I align? How do I align myself with this journey you're calling me into? And that that led us into relocating down to Dallas, Texas to attend Christ for the Nations Institute. And um, and my, my, my third week here, the Lord connected me to Cindy Jacobs. And I never, you know, and, and um, the Lord had actually spoken to my husband, you know, about connecting us to her. And I just thought, oh yeah, we're going to be in the same place. And, you know, that we, we should cross paths, but never in the way that he, um, you know, allowed me to come alongside her for mentorship and, you know, um, and, and just to partner with her in the prayer movement, in the prophetic movement. And really she's become a spiritual mom to us. We're ordained by her and our ministries under her covering and all that. And, um, you know, I've traveled with her even after no longer working for her, but continue to travel and minister alongside her. And, um, you know, and then after that with Dutch Sheets and also that mentoring. Um, but really, it's just been a gift from the Lord, because I promise you, ever since I um, uh, left, you know, that that career path that I had, you know, all of those goals for law school and to be an attorney, I just gave the Lord my yes. I left my, what was going to be a, um, you know, I was in, on a promotion path for a six figure income in New York city, the organization I was working for that had a legal and, um, uh, uh, social service department and all that. And, you know, left that to transition and come out here to Dallas, Texas, to be a student at Christ for the nation's Institute. To I, have, Bible college <laughs> yeah, I, I have <laughs> never, ever in my life had to seek out a job. I've never pursued a job. Every single opportunity in ministry, it has been an invitation. I've right. never had to apply for jobs and go through all these interview processes. Never. Every single opportunity, it's been an open door that the Lord has said, okay, now this is what I want you to do in this season. And it makes me think of uh, Philippians. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. But where Philippians, where Paul said, everything I once counted so important, I now yeah. count as loss. Yeah. And the other thing I thought of is what your husband, Anthony, said. Once you hear from the Lord, even if you come across tough times That's after right. you make the decision, do you know that you're holding on to that promise that you heard? Like you right. said, you never even heard those two words put together. So it couldn't have been your thought. And when you know it's the Lord, 
you can look past some of the inconveniences or the attack. The enemy will get in, will bring self doubt into you, like, "What are you crazy? Why would you do this?" And you're like, "No, I heard from God, so I'm at peace with my decision." And it doesn't mean everything goes so smoothly, but you know that you have the confidence that you heard from Him. So it's so important what you said, Anthony, about teaching people how to hear from God, because once they do, they don't want to go back to the other version, the counterfeits. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. If I could interject, one of the things that I've learned most from Cindy is, you know, Cindy, people come to her all the time. Cindy, I need help with this. You're the prophet. I need to hear from God. Mm -hmm. So we would go to Cindy and say, Cindy, we're going through this. We need answers for this. We need answers for that. And Cindy would just sit there and smile and just look at us, listen to us and hear us out. And we're like, well, what do you have to say? She'd be like, what has the Lord said to you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. have you? Have you heard from the Lord yet? Like, no, like, that's what we're here to speak to you. You know, you hear from him, so tell us. And, and it just taught us this, this persistence of prayer and getting before him mm -hmm. and waiting to hear for his voice. You know what yeah. I mean? Uh, and kind of the same thing that I learned from Dutch as well, this persistence in prayer, you know, this tenacity of praying. You know, we're going to see this thing shift we got to see it shift through prayer. And so that means I can't be lax in the place of prayer. I can't, I can't, you know, have anxiety in the place of prayer. I need to be at peace and I need to keep pushing forward in the place, in the place of prayer. And, and in, in a way, I think our culture being so short term thinking and so many little bumper stickers and just, you know, 40 characters or whatever it is on Twitter, like that, that drives you to be impatient in general. We want everything immediately. And, and this is all about calming yourself down and waiting and listening right. and really trusting that he's going to speak to you. If you haven't had a good father relationship and, and your father didn't speak to you well, you might be doubting that God wants to speak to you too. And, you know, that's not the case. He does. He loves you. He, he rewards the people who diligently seek after him. Mm -hmm. And if you think he's going to answer you in 30 seconds, then you're not really diligently seeking. 100%. You know, one of the things earlier you had said, um, you know, that it's it, it's different when you learn about prayer from a book mm -hmm. um, and from seeing other people's lives and, you know, their ministries and how they live a life of prayer. But it, then it's different when it really becomes personal. Right. And like I said, I've had the privilege of partnering with these generals in the prayer movement, um, even to pray on national initiatives. But I always tell people, like when I teach on prayer, I always say as big an honor as all of that has been and as much as I've learned from all of them and from their books and, and all of that, I always tell people that my my biggest, um, my, my most intense boot camp or school of prayer has been praying for our son. Mm. Um, we have... You know, and, and so that's where it's like, oh, all these principles that I learned in prayer that I've been using to pray for our government and, you know, to pray for our nation and for all of these things. Now we needed, we, we were, we, our son, we have one son. He's our miracle boy because we've had, um, for us, it's just been an, an, an entire battle just for us even having children. We've lost yeah. several. Mm -hmm. um, we've got five babies in heaven that we're going to meet someday. Yeah. Um, but this is our miracle boy that was fully born, you know, full term baby. And, and he was actually born with some heart defects and he almost died at mm. three weeks of age, had to have emergency open heart surgery. And through his lifetime, he's now 11 years old. By the age of nine, he had had 12 surgeries, Wow. 12 surgeries and all these other, you know, things. And, and I tell you that that walking through life, um, walking through that situation, walking, battling for our son's life, for his health, battling for his destiny. I mean, contending for the calling of God on his life, the promises of God on his life. That has been my most intense training school, training program in Absolutely. prayer. Because we had to grapple. It wasn't something apart from us. It wasn't something outside of us. This was our our home, this was our family, this right. was our child that we were contending for his life. And, and we have experienced, I mean, numerous 
numerous miracles in his body. I mean, where he's had aorta that was closing up, miraculously open. He's had organs that were supposed to be damaged from no oxygenated blood, be miraculously preserved in the process and completely healed and whole with no defects. He's had legs that because they had no oxygenated blood, weakened muscles. Um, that he had, you know, no muscle tone and he developed muscle tone and strengthened his legs supernaturally, not with, not through therapy, Praise supernaturally, God. but along the way, along the way, we've also had to partner with God in praying through working with the medical community, working with doctors and also wrestling with the, well, I don't know why God chose to do it that way that right. time, you know, and why another time it just happened miraculously. And, and, and that whole journey of wrestling with God in that, like in that place of prayer and learning to hear the voice of God for strategies in prayer, even for our son, like Anthony said, talking about the importance of learning to hear and discern the voice of God. Like there was one time that we, we spent three months, a whole group, we got together. We set up a Facebook group, fasting and prayer um, and, and making daily decrees over our son and all of this and scripted prayers. And we were doing all of it because he had a problem in his heart that required another open heart surgery at the age of about six or seven years old. Three months of fasting and prayer. And he had his uh, blood pressure. He sh it should have been between 108 and 112. It was averaging 135 to 165 wow. because of this heart condition right. he was having. And the doctor said, there is no way to fix this other than another complete open heart surgery like he had when he was a little baby. Mm. And we were like, no, we're not receiving this. We mm -hmm. don't accept this report. I asked the doctors, well, is this an emergency or do we have time to pray? He said, okay, he was you know, a believer. And he said, I'll give you time to pray and see what happens. But every two weeks, I want you to bring your son here and we're gonna check his blood pressure. And if we're not seeing a gradual decrease in blood pressure, indicating that there's something happening in there, we need to schedule this surgery. And I said, okay, give us time. This lasted for three months where every two weeks we take him to the doctor and wow. every two weeks his blood pressure was lower and lower and lower yeah. until Great. the doctor said, okay, it's pretty much within normal range. I don't know what happened. And he did all the tests <laughs> and they were able to see an echocardiogram of the heart that that aorta opened up supernaturally. He said, I don't know what happened here, but we don't he need to talk Baptist, about it. He was a good Baptist, so this yeah, is all new for him. Jesus loving, you know, Christian, but Baptist. <laughs> right, right. And he said, I don't know what happened, but it just seemed to open up. Whatever you did work, I said, I know what this is called. It's called a miracle because we prayed. So fast forward to two years later, two years later, Caleb starts having the same blood pressure problems. And I was so angry. And I'm thinking, oh, no, no, devil, you're not going to steal this victory from us. We prayed through this. We got the victory. And again, the doctors were saying, there's no way to fix this. He needs to have open heart surgery. And so, um, so we're like, and he's like, and we need, like, we need to do this now. Okay. Because his, his life is in danger. We need to do this now. So I'm thinking, all right, I know what to do. I know what to do. I'm going to get, you know, mobilize people to fast and pray. We're going to do daily decrees over his, you know, his heart right. and all of this. And, you know, and, and I'm thinking, I already know what to do because we did it two years ago and it worked, right? <laughs> and when I finally quieted myself <laughs> and was just, you know, in this intimate time with the Lord, I heard him ask me, did you ask me how you should pray? Oh boy. And I was like, oh, no, I didn't. How should I pray? Yeah. And he said, I just want you to thank me for what I've already done and receive the breakthrough. Wow. And I said, so you don't want us to fast? No. You don't want us to mobilize all these people to pray with us? No. You don't want us to make daily decrees over our son? No, I just want you to thank me for what I've already done and receive the breakthrough. And that was really hard for this prayer warrior, mama bear that, that has contended for her son, even since before he was born, right? Amen. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, like I felt helpless and paralyzed, you know? <laughs> and it was so hard for me to do that. And for right. me to say, thank you for what you've already done, it was hard for me because yeah. At first, I didn't believe it. Yeah. Mm. I didn't believe it was already done. Mm. I didn't, like, I, but I had to keep praying this out and declaring it. 
Thank you. It is done. You've already done the work. He's already healed. Thank you for the breakthrough. Whatever the breakthrough looks like, I just thank you for it because it's done. And this was our prayer. We still had to walk through the process with the doctors. And when the doctors had their consultation, the team of doctors to yeah. figure out the plan for how they were going to do with surgery and, you know, and all of that, they called us and they said, well, we just want to let you know about the consultation, what the plan is for your son. They said, we brought in a new doctor from Houston into the team and she reviewed your son's case. And she's actually a doctor who, um, and, and, and she's a doctor who has, who has actually worked with a new medical breakthrough technology that we can use on your son and will require no open heart surgery. <laughs> Praise God. Said it's a day surgery, in and out, simple little incision through the thigh, you know, mm -hmm. up through the artery, day procedure, in and out of the hospital in a couple of hours, no open heart surgery required. It was a little step that will grow with him into adulthood. It did not exist. It was not approved by the FDA, FDA is it? Yeah. It w did not exist, was not approved by the FDA two years prior, but now it exists and it was approved for use. And this doctor on the team said, this new medical breakthrough technology is the answer. He does not need open heart surgery. Praise God. That was when I heard that I fell apart because that was the word of the Lord. Receive the breakthrough. I didn't know it was a new medical breakthrough technology, but he said, receive the breakthrough and thank me for what I've already done. Mm. He had already done it. He had already made provision. So I don't know why, and I don't understand why he chose to do it that way one time, and the other time it happened miraculously and answered a fasting and prayer. Yeah. But it's just a matter of not, you know, not thinking that we always have the answers or the strategy, but continually living life, continually yielded to the Holy Spirit, hearing the voice of the Lord yeah. for strategies in prayer. Because well, it seems pretty obvious listening to the story that he wanted you to learn that oh, yeah. the effort you were putting in was great but you still should wait and ask me each time kind of like david back in the old testament he won the battle one way and he assumed yeah. and the lord said nope you're gonna have to wait till you hear the sound in the trees so that was better than an mba you know yeah. you learned you know <laughs> firsthand that uh he doesn't do it the same way every time no. for your right. benefit. Right? But it's so easy yeah. to get locked into a habit, something that you're very familiar with. It's right. also a form of control. And even in this day and hour that we're in, we have to be on our faces to hear the Lord and how we're going to cross over and how we're, you know, even preparing for what's ahead with all the heart, you know, the souls that are coming to know Jesus. And we can't go about it the same way. That's why we have to really tap into prayer and like you said anthony hearing the voice of the lord and really establishing that now you said something earlier about god called you both really because you're one to legislate in prayer so why don't you elaborate a little bit on that for the audience in case they don't know what that means because we have great authority and great power you said it early on that we are seated in heavenly places and we rule and reign we are kings and priests we rule and reign from a place of authority and then seeing god's perspective but we can just get in a rut of habit of not really, well, it worked the last time, or this is what we ought to do. No, we have to sit and wait to hear, as you're saying, what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. But but just talk a little bit about your uh, the opportunity that you've had in, in prayer and in legislating and how it's made a difference. And what does that exactly mean, to legislate in prayer? Before she touches on that, I just wanted to touch on the issue of strategy for one second. Okay. Because strategy is important, yes, but what's equally as important, even more important, is us actually being able to receive the strategy. Because a lot of times, you know, what the Bible says that His ways are higher than our Absolutely. ways, His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And a lot of times, the strategies that He gives us in the place of prayer, or even you know, prophecy, prophetic ministry, they're absurd to us. They're absurd to our mind because they can even offend our natural thinking. Right. You know, and if we don't, if we allow ourselves to be led by our mind, by our natural thinking, by our intellect and our level of understanding, then we will miss answers to prayer quite a bit. We will miss a response from heaven and a breakthrough quite a bit because the strategies just seem so off to us. Right. Like that. Don't don't pray. Don't fast. Don't do anything that you know how to do. Just receive. That's pretty foreign to somebody who's just <laughs> used to. You know, let's take out the sword and the gun and the mallet all the time. You know, so Amen, sister. It's so important to be able to receive the strategy without allowing our mind to get in the way of it. So. Right. Now, that's good. 
great point. Um, well, as far as like this, you know, phrase that, that the Lord spoke over me about legislating to prayer, I didn't understand it really, you know, when he spoke that to me. I just knew it was an invitation from the Lord mm -hmm. and whatever he had for me was better than what I was planning for myself. So I said, yes. Um, but, you know, scripture, when scripture speaks to us of, you know, it, the church and the church can be translated um, two ways. Um, it's translated as the oikos, which is the, the church, the family of God. Right. That is the congregation. That's like the sheep in the sheepfold, right? And that is part of the identity of the church. But the word church, you know, as we see it used throughout like the New Testament, when we see the word church, it's actually more often translated into the word ecclesia. Right. And the word ecclesia, um, that was, they were uh, in biblical times, they were the called out ones, right. okay? So for the Hebrews, they were the called out ones. They were the elders who would meet at the gates. They would meet at the gates. You know, back in biblical times, cities, they were walled in. They were mm -hmm. these walled cities and then they had gates. And those at those gates, so the, the ecclesia were the called out ones. They were like elders, they were leaders, they were respected leaders in the society that were called out from the city to meet at the gates. And they would meet at the gates of the city and there they would legislate. They would establish the laws, the rules, they would decide what was permissible within their city, within their community, and what could not be. They would actually decide, you know, the laws. They would, if there was a legal case, they were the ones who came together and they would adjudicate justice. They would decide, okay, what is, what, is, what should be the outcome in this case? So we as the body of Christ, and then also to the Romans, the ecclesia, they were the um, the conquerors, they were the ones who would, they, they would go into a particular city, like ambassadors, right? They would go into a particular city or particular region, and they would actually conquer that city, and they would transform that city. You know, you've, you've heard the phrase, um, when in Rome, do as the Romans do, right? right. So to the Romans, um, the ecclesia, they were the ones who would actually go into a particular city or region and they would transform that city or that region like so them. that everywhere you looked, it looked like Rome. From right. the architecture, to the education system, to the foods that they ate, to the language that they spoke, they were trying to transition society, transform society, so that no matter where you looked, it looked like Rome. So, we, so this applies to us spiritually and even practically as a church because we are called as the ecclesia. We are a legislative assembly, right, who stand at the gates, at the gates of whatever it is, at the gates of our nation, at the gates of our city, whatever sphere of authority God's given us, at the gate of our workplace, the gates of our family. And we actually have the authority through Jesus Christ for us to legislate in the heavens through prayer, right? And we decree what is permissible and what cannot That's right. be. It's like we draw the lines in the spirit when we are praying, when we're making when we're making prophetic decrees, right? And then we also we also act as those um, those uh, ambassadors. We 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 act as those you know those conquerors over um, those transformers of society. Where we also by our prayers we are causing transformation to come about. We are causing atmospheres to shift Absolutely. and situations to change so that it looks like the kingdom of heaven everywhere that we go. Ooh, that's we so are, good. It's the prayer of your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Where we're taking those heavenly realities, the will of God, and we're releasing them into the earth realm through our prayers. So, um, so legislating in the heavens, and then there's also this dynamic of the courtrooms of heaven. And when we, we actually can bring our case to the Lord, like our legal case to the mm -hmm. to God, and we can we can plead that case before him. And Jesus acts as our advocate, right? And he 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 acts as our advocate on our behalf. And um, and he has already declared the victory for us. He's already won the victory for us, right? So we bring this case to we bring this case to the Father. Jesus is our advocate, and he presents himself as a righteous one, right? And so the Father sees us as righteous, as justified through Jesus Christ. So that the things that we present to the Father, the things that we request of Him in the name of Jesus, in faith in Jesus, finished work, then those things are done for us, right? We see them accomplished in the earth realm. So that's, that's just a, a story in terms of legislating through. That's a great answer. I heard one fact from a historian that really stuck with me. 
about the point about how the Romans would go in. I have my DNA done, and I'm 100% Italian, right from that area. So these are my uh, these are my peeps. Way back when, they were pretty mean. But so in Rome, they didn't have a lot of statues of Caesar because he was in Rome. But in the outlying provinces, when they would take over, they put statues up everywhere to remind the people who the emperor was. And then Paul calls us the ambassadors. So when we come out from the church and we're in the world, we're the same thing. We're representing a different kingdom, only we're living temples, right? So like, if we're not doing that because we're so cloistered always in the church and always with other Christians all the time, we're really not fulfilling that role. We can't legislate because we're hiding from the world. And I know we're in it, we're not of it, but we're supposed to be out there reflecting the nature of God and let them see it instead of just always talking about it. They watch how people interact together when they're Christians. It's very different than the way the world acts. And you were from New York, so you know that you guys had to really fight for everything just to get a word in edgewise, right? Yeah. You know, she's, she's more the teacher. I, I say I'm more the storyteller. Last year we were in Puerto Rico, and we were in the Capitol building taking a tour. And we're on this tour. Few, there's a few people with us in the tour. And all of a sudden, the tour guy gets a phone call. Just, yep. Yeah, okay. She gets off the phone. She goes, um, there's a senator that wants to see you in her office. Okay. So they take us to this lady's office. Turns out she's the first uh, ever believer. She's a pastor on the island. First ever believer voted into office in Puerto Rico. Oh, the Rico. first full-time minister. First full-time like minister. That, yeah, that was her um, vocation. Well, and it turns out she want, she wanted us to go. She heard that we were there because we had done some ministry in the chapel of the Capitol earlier in the day. So uh, she wanted us in her office to pray over this bill that she had introduced. The pro-life bill. Yeah. The first. Very wow. first pro-life yeah. bill in Puerto Rico. So it was the first ever. They have no pro-life legislation or laws in Puerto Rico. So she was, a, she was the first person to ever introduce a bill, and it was deadlocked. It was stalled. Um, because of the language, you know, the, the governor is very liberal and things like that. It, yeah. And so he had vetoed it. The I think it was the Senate had passed it. It still had to go to the House. And then to the governor's desk for signature. Well, she said, I want you guys to come. She pulls out the actual bill that she presented, puts it on her desk. She goes, I want you guys just to lay hands on the bill and, and declare that it will pass. So Amen. we did that. We laid our hands on the bill. We decreed in Jesus' name. It's going to go from deadlock to pass and into law in Jesus name. We left the island a few days later, two weeks later, we get the news, we see it, we see it online that it had passed. It, it actually went uh, to the house, they passed it and they there's a loophole where they can actually go over the governor's head if he vetoes it to put it into law. So they did that. They went over the governor's head because he wasn't gonna sign it into law and they put it into law anyway. Praise uh, God. That's awesome. You know, I love the portion of scripture in Luke 18 where the woman, you know, was bothering that unjust judge and she said, give me justice or she said, avenge me from my adversary. And that's a judicial term. I mean, with the, that word avenge, it literally means to do justice or to vindicate one's rights. And she didn't let go. And when you really study that out, it, it literally says that when you look up the words in the King James, that she, she made him black and blue by her persistence. This, and he was an unjust judge. And wow. that, and, the, and so, and, and there's five times the wording in there is that the Lord says, I will avenge you and not revenge, he will avenge us. And I love that because she didn't give up. And it's like mama bear praying for her kids. I'm not backing down and I'm not giving up. You're going to back down because here's what the word of God says. And that, and that's the thing that the reality of the word, you have to become one, intimate, one with that word. And that, that the word of God is more of a reality than really what's happening. And that's, that right. comes from our meditation in the word. But I love that. It's like, give me justice. And then the Lord says, well, when I come back, will I find faith on the earth? And so the enemy's goal is always to sideswipe us and to, or ambush us to where we get off course because he doesn't want us to have faith. And he wants mm -hmm. us to get so sidetracked, which happens at times, but then we have to get back on track, get in the presence of the Lord and say, wait a second, Lord, what are you saying about this thing? I know what I see, but I call those things as be not as though they are. And just like when you went to pray, you could have said in Puerto Rico, well, you know, I don't know about this. I mean, this is a difficult thing. You know, we'll pray, but I don't know. No, you went in there with, you legislated in prayer, in authority, 
and, and, and look at what happened. And that's the thing that I think is really important that we as Christians recognize that God wants us to come up higher and to mm -hmm. understand that we are to rule and reign and we are to call those things which be known as though they are. I think of Daniel. When Daniel took a stand, we have to, the body of Christ has to rise up. And, and take a stand. Daniel took a stand, and the government, the people came against him, as you know. And he said, I'm praying. He said, you're not going to pray. Well, he, well, he was praying three times a day. He said, I'm praying. And so what did they do? They threw him into the lion's den. But see, God had his back, right? And so, you know, the lion, you know, nothing happened to him, but, but there was a turnaround situation. And the thing is that we know that then the, the adversary, they were all thrown into the den and, you know, they were destroyed. But as we are faithful, I love Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they said to the king, you know what? We ain't bowing to you. You know, and even if God doesn't come through for you, for us, we are not bowing to you. See, that's the tenacity and that's that development of the word of God that, listen, if God be for me, who can be against me? We have done, we have stood, we know what it's like out in the world, but now we have taken a stand and God has transformed our lives and we're not going any other way. We're keeping our eyes fixed on him. And so I just love that the passion that you both have and what you're sharing because we have got to understand that we need to legislate in our country. And some people may think, well, that's ridiculous. How are we going to have control over that? Listen, I don't know how we, we do what we do. I just know that, like you said several times, God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are above our thoughts. He just wants us to obey what he says to do. Because a lot of the prophetic acts, a lot of the things that we have done, you just thanking the Lord for my son being healed in the natural, like freaking out, you know, like I need to go to the hospital. I need to do something. But the Lord gave you a word. And you held on to that word. And that's the thing about you, what you said earlier about learning to hear his voice. I mean, there's thousands of teachings out there. And it's, here's a simple thing. God is really simple. Just get in his presence, sit there, read the word, and then just wait on him. Be quiet. <laughs> you know, a lot of us like to talk. But be quiet and wait. And to develop that hearing and, and write down what you sense the Spirit of the Lord is saying. And so, um, anyway, I just, I, you know, anything with prayer I love. And I feel that, you know, God wants to bring us all to a whole nother level. And I'm, I'm ready for it because, you know, I want to see transformation and change. Of course, in our home, you know, we had a similar situation with our, our younger son. And the doctor told us that our son was dead. And, um, you know, uh, our first son, we had a C-section. They said there was complications. But the second one, now they tell me he's dead. But here's the thing. The Lord gave me a strategy for nine months. Now, I'm, he said to me, I want you every day to get out scripture and, he's, and to write it out. He says, I want you to decree over your body life. I want you to speak over your cervix. I want you to speak over the umbilical cord. I want you to speak over the baby. I mean, he gave me a whole list of things that I was to say. I did it every, every day for nine months. So naturally, I thought I wasn't even going to have labor pains. I thought, oh, man, this is going to be a breeze here. You know, of course, that didn't happen. But anyway, I didn't go to the hospital right away. And I, I, just, I just knew that I was so full of the word and what he said that um, when, they, when it came time to give birth, um, they said to me, we're going to have to do an emergency section. They said, because... Um, you know, we, we think your son is dead. We don't have any heartbeat, blah, blah, blah. And, of course, I said to Peter, being from New Jersey, punch him in the face. I said, just punch him in the face because, you know, that you need to be quiet. Word, just so people know, that was not in the word. Well, I was just a little I'm agitated at the time. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, he didn't punch him in the face, but... I was annoyed because don't speak over what God promised me, right? So the guy's probably thinking I'm a crazy lady. Anyway, they took me into the operating room, and they were scrubbing, and I was so upset. I said, Lord, you promised me. You promised that I would give birth. And so the anesthesiologist did something where he had a, just prolonged it. They're scrubbing. And I heard the enemy say, give up, and I screamed, no. I mean, they must have thought I had a couple of different personalities going on here. But anyway, I started pushing, and I gave birth, and my son had a 9.9 .9 APGAR score. Peter was the, I mean, and believe me, I mean, we both were praying, but that was such warfare, and it was such, 
incredible, you know, pressing through. But that's the power of the word. To the very end, the enemy will try to get us off course and give up. But when you fill yourself up with the word, and, and it's a constant filling. It's not a one-shot deal, right? I mean, it's constant that we have to, because you got to hear all the different ways that the Holy Spirit tells you to, to move forward. So, you know, we've experienced it as you have experienced it. And I'm looking forward to more and more of what God has in store for us and in, 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 in that break or anointing to break through in prayer. And, um, but I want the body of Christ to recognize we are all called to operate in this. We are all called to pray from the heart of God, not just our stuff, but to pray from the heart of God and release that prophetic word that, that you know, you shall decree that thing and it shall be established unto you. And when we release that thing, it breaks things, ooh, it breaks things open. I'm knocking the <laughs> mic over over here. Anyway, so... Um, you should be a preacher, girl. You yeah, I know, right? I know. <laughs> but, um, you know, so, so God is good. Amen? Yes. Can I ask a question? Yeah, you may. Yeah. You can't squeeze my leg to tell me to stand <laughs> up. <now. laughs> <laughs> it under the table. Like, so you see me wince. When Let me talk. <laughs> so in the last week, I've talked to a couple different people that have experienced God in a new way and felt like the attack increased because they felt like they were messing with the dark kingdom and maybe i better not get too involved with that because there's going to be backlash coming at me and fear tried to enter into them like maybe because i'm getting closer to god you know bad things are happening to me so i know how we respond to that i'm just curious because i'm sure you've heard that and i'm wondering how you respond to that well, um, you know, we have been given, you know, the question is not one of authority. Um, we have been given all authority, right, through Jesus Christ. Um, but we, the same way that, you know, we were just having this whole conversation about listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit in terms of how do we engage in prayer, you know, it, it, we also need to um track with the Holy Spirit and, and hear the voice of God for what our assignments are in prayer right. and the timing for those assignments. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's not a matter of, oh, do we have an authority, you know, to go in there and go in there? We've been given all authority, but do we have the permission of the Lord in that timing to go and, for example, try to tear down this principality or, you know, come against this stronghold and you know, things like that. So it, it really is a matter of listening to the voice of, of the Lord for what the strategy is in mm -hmm. prayer. Because even as I just talked about for my son, you know, one strategy that, that the Lord released me in, in if for one season, that was not the strategy of the Lord for the next season. Right. It was even the same problem within his heart. Um, and it was a totally different strategy in prayer that the Lord was giving me. And had I prayed the other way, had I prayed the way that I thought was right and that, hey, well, I have the authority, you know, to pray this way. And, you know, and this is, you know, I, well, I'm just going to decree all these scriptures and call everyone to fasting and prayer again. I, I really believe if I had prayed that way, I wouldn't, we wouldn't have seen the breakthrough, you know, right. for our son. Right. But the Lord, but he gave us the very specific strategy for that situation in that timing. And it was a exactly it unfolded exactly according to the word of the lord right. and i think as we as as intercessors um you know engaging a prophetic intercession is all about the prophetic revelation by the holy spirit on what is on the heart of god right. what is the father speaking about this situation in this moment and how is it that we are supposed to pray the scriptures tell us right in romans that we are um, we don't know how to pray as we ought. Right. Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. So, so we do, you, you also had, I'm sorry, you also had some generals in your life. And I think sometimes people don't want to bother somebody and or they think I should know enough by now. I shouldn't have to go ask somebody. Mm -hmm. But it's really a safety net to have a multitude of counsel that you trust that, that have already been through the wars a few times and might think of something and you're really not asking them for permission per se, but you're just honoring that relationship that they're seasoned people in the Lord. Mm -hmm. And you say, hey, this is what I'm hearing. 
would you mind praying about it and see if that bears witness with you? That's a safety net, not, not you know, that you still have your training wheels on. It's a show of confidence that you know that you can trust their opinion. Yes. And that's, you know, we know that when, when we're learning about just the prophetic in general, right? When we receive a prophetic word, the scriptures admonish us. We're supposed to test every word. Right. Those words are supposed to be judged. It's the same with prophetic revelation, right? Concerning how to pray about certain situations. And it, it's, it's wisdom and it's biblical admonishment for us to take those words and to submit those words to be judged. If, we, if we're unsure, oh, am I supposed to pray this way? Am I supposed to, you know, am I supposed to contend against this particular, you know, um, uh, 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 power of darkness or principality or whatever the case may be. There are there are people in authority and in leadership that the Lord has given to us that he's positioned around us and he's positioned us under for us to submit those words that we get, that prophetic revelation we get in the place of prayer and say, hey, I'm submitting this to be judged. You know, mm -hmm. and, and there's there are three dimensions in the prophetic, right? There's the revelation where we receive the revelation, then there's the interpretation. And when it comes to the interpretation, there's wisdom in a multitude Absolutely. of counselors. Yeah. So we submit that for wise counsel amongst people that the Lord has placed around us. And then there's the application. That's the strategy. That's how do we carry it out? You know, what what do we what what does it mean is the interpretation, but then how do we how do we carry it out and implement this prophetic word? So these dynamics, we're talking about prophetic intercession. So we can't we cannot exclude the principles that apply when we, for proper stewardship of prophetic words, of prophetic revelation, we cannot exclude that from being responsible prophetic intercessors as well. Right, yeah, that's I mean, very good. To this day, you know, we're our own people. We're not serving any of these generals any longer, uh, per se, right? Uh, we're our own people with our own ministry, doing our own thing with the Lord, following our own path. And we are submitted to pastoral leadership. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're planted in our church. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, the legal but, disclaimer. Yeah, le yes. exactly. We're not long rangers. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, to this day, when, when the Lord gives us a word, you know, that we need to put out a national yeah. word for a region, you know, internationally, we still, we send it to, we send it to various people that we trust, that we allow to speak into our lives, to test, to judge, and to weigh. And if they say, hey, you know, you shouldn't really put it out that way. You should maybe change language. Why don't you think about that? We, we take that into heavy consideration. Yeah, that's wise. That. Okay. Yeah. That's, not, that's not a complete word. You know, and that's, and that's okay. And I think everybody that's a prophetic voice in the prayer, whatever it may be, should have people like that, trusted people in their right. lives, to be able to submit things like that to mm -hmm. Yeah, that's I think really that, good. Uh, part of what Jesus was saying when he said a servant and a son, you know, the difference between a servant and a son and how you're you're willing, if you're a son and you have a father that, you know, loves you, you don't need all that immediate answer right away. And, and you'll strive in your own efforts to try to find your identity. But when the right. father gives you your identity, it's when the son sets you free because you're carrying the father's identity, then you're free indeed. And you're not keep trying to earn. But some people are afraid to submit it because they want to be the first one out with the word. And, you know, what if they take my, I mean, you know, there's all this mistrust. It's like an orphan spirit, which I don't mean, you know, any harm against people who don't have parents. You know, it's a, it's a symbolic sign of being detached and not being connected to a safe place that, that you can trust. And you're really trying to do it out there on their own, on your own, and the devil loves that, right? Because right. it only takes one mistake when you're drifting off by yourself. And when you have that covering, there's safety in that. Yeah, yeah. Wow, it's been an hour already. This has been so good. We can go on and on and on. There's so many things that we can talk about, but we want to have you guys come up to New Jersey in person. And uh, as soon as this COVID thing is <laughs> over with, uh, but we're praying, getting a right heart attitude about this thing. Um, but anyway, so before we close, would either of you like to pray us out and just pray whatever the Lord puts on your heart? Yeah, let me start and then we'll pick it up and just yep. tag team here. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, Father, I thank you, Lord, for um, everyone under the sound of my voice, Father. And I thank you, Lord, that we have stepped into this new era of Pentecost. And Father, it is an era in which you are pouring out a, a new measure of your Holy Spirit in our lives and you're increasing our capacity 
our capacity to receive of your spirit. And so, Father, I just pray for an activation within everyone, within the sound of my voice, an activation, Father, of their ability to hear your voice, God, even as you are pouring it out, as you are <laughs> releasing, God, this, this greater measure of your spirit upon us, God, that there would be a grace, Father, within us, God, to be able to hear your voice more clearly. Yes. Father, I just I just break off the lies right now off of those that, that, that would say, I can't hear the voice of God, yeah. or God doesn't speak speak to me. I decree that this is the part of the privilege and your right as a child of God, as a shepherd within the sheepfold of the good shepherd, that you can hear his voice as one of his sheep. So I break that lie off of you now. And I just declare, you have the ability to hear the voice of God. And we just invite right now, just, just invite the Holy Spirit to woo you, to draw you into the place of where you can hear the voice of God, to draw you into the place of stillness to draw you into that place of quieting your soul to hear the voice of God. And I decree open eyes over you right now as well, that you can see what the Father is doing. You can see the activity of heaven and you can come into partnership and alignment with it. So Father, I declare, I declare open ears and open eyes for them to see and hear in the spirit so that they can respond to what you are saying and they can partner with you in and intercession in prophetic decrees. Father, I just call forth a rising up and a coming higher. Father, as you say in Song of Songs too, arise and come away with me. Father, that they would hear your voice saying, arise and come away with me. And they would come into that higher place, God, that produces the fruitfulness, that higher place of, of John 15, abiding with Christ in the vine, that produces the fruitfulness of the kingdom in their lives. Yeah, Amen. this morning when I woke up, I just heard the Lord say, um, that just like in First Kings 19, just tell them I'm in the whisper. Mm. You know, I'm, I'm in the whisper now. And, and I saw this image of just various people, and they had like tornadoes just swirling around their head uh, because of all the noise of the hour, the noise mm. of coronavirus, the, the noise of racism, the noise yeah. of rioting, and looting, the noise of protesting, and the noise of everything else going on in the world right now. And I just saw the Lord coming and batting his hands and causing the, the twisters going around people's heads to stop so they can hear the whisper. Amen. Because he wasn't in the noise. He was in the whisper. And I feel like that's what the Lord is doing with many right now that are watching. Amen. Causing that noise to cease so that you can hear his whisper, so you can hear that, that still small voice so clear. Amen. So clear yeah. in what you're supposed to do in this hour, where you're supposed to be, and what you're supposed to say. For some of you, what you're supposed to write. In right. this very hour. So yeah. I just thank you, Father, for clearing thank out you. the noise so that they Amen. can hear the whisper of Jesus. There Amen. was a confirmation in the natural to what yeah. you just said, because I'm, I'm down at the Jersey Shore, and this is a, a house that's been in my family my whole life. And uh, a storm blew through today so fast. It wow. was a beautiful day, and I was distracted with something. All of a sudden, I hear rain. I go outside, and I'm telling you, it looked like a supercell hit the region and things were blowing and people's stuff got all blown over the place like a little mini tornado and then it was dead calm right after that right oh. so i i've never Amen. seen that i've been here my whole life never seen that happen so i really feel like you know it was the lord that you said that yes and uh wow. i posted the the video i took a 30 second video while it was happening yeah. because it was just like what you see out in kansas you know in the, in, in the plains we don't normally get that kind of weather here so uh, I think it's really right on. That word is that we're really distracted with all the other noise, but listen for that still small voice. And I had a word oh, for you guys while uh, Melissa was praying. So, um, you know, what I love about watching you interact together is it's similar to me and Trisha. I'm a little slower and, you know, calmer, and she's that ready to go, you know, <laughs> which is great uh, because we complement each other. And, you know, I, I have become the president of her fan club. Uh, you know, I've been saying that a lot lately. And I yeah. see that about the two of you too. And, um, you know, that's such a strength that you're, you're comfortable in your own skin and you're not threatened by the other person's differences or their strengths. And, and you act as a, a, a counterbalancing weight uh, in, in good ways. And, and I'm sure you're pulling something out of each other as well. And I just want to speak that over you. That, uh, and, and to encourage you to, to remember that, to be your, your spouse, the president of your spouse's fan club, 
Yeah. Even when sometimes that takes faith too, right? Like you're, you're not always going to get along and agree with everything. And I'm guessing it might be hard to be married to somebody who went to law school because she knows how to make her arguments, right? But uh, that's when the Lord comes in. Maybe in Texas, do they think you talk a little fast down there sometimes? <laughs> <laughs> a lot. But, but just be yourself, right? Just be yourself because God has blessed you guys amazingly. And we're going to do everything we can to help get you up here and let people, you know, just receive an impartation from you as well because you're in a next generation from us. And they need to hear people at their, level, at their age and with their experience level because you can relate to them differently than we can. Amen. And uh, we're just really honored to know you guys and really thrilled that that we have this connection. Amen. Well, this was so good. And um, we look forward to connecting as soon as we get the okay. We will have you in. We're also renovating a new uh, place where we're moving into. So we still need our certificate of occupancy. So that will be pretty soon. But um you know, but it's, we're excited. We're in a new era, like you said. Oh, that is exciting. Yeah, and so we, we are excited for what the Lord has, yeah. So. And we just pray that the chaos in America would yes. settle down, that yes. the amount of hatred that's flying through the atmosphere would be just diffused. I just see the Lord just pulling the fuse out of the dynamite right now and that, that people would just come to their senses, like the man that was in the pigsty, that prodigal son just came to his senses and realized, wait a minute, what I'm doing, mm -hmm. this isn't working. I've got to try a different strategy. So Lord, we just ask you, like you said, if we would just turn to you, call on your name, repent, mm -hmm. and then just cry out on behalf of our nation that you would hear from heaven mm -hmm. and that you would heal this land. So Lord, we love America. We love what you've given us here and what the nation stands for. And we just ask you to bring healing to the hearts of the people that are hurting and broken right now and allow this uh, lockdown to, to end so that we can get back to life and, and seeing each other and not be so isolated from each other. We curse that sickness at its root right now and command it to die. And we just say that this season will end. Uh, this season of strife will end and the peace of God will come in and rule and reign in Jesus' name. And, and I just want to bind that spirit of um, deception. Lord, I bind that spirit of deception, Lord, and we command the scales over people's eyes to be removed in Jesus' name, and we loose the spirit of truth, that truth will prevail, oh God, that, Father, you give them dreams and visions, that um, just the, just the, the, the um, conviction of Holy Spirit will overshadow um, all of us, and, and that we will see in ways that we haven't, but I do bind that spirit of deception that, that has wreaked um, havoc in our land of lawlessness and defiance and rebellion and witchcraft. Lord, we just loose the power of the blood and we just thank you, Father, that you have a plan. And just like that squall, that cell that came so quickly, and then there was a, a calm, we call forward that calm right now, Lord, that there's that turnaround season because you had to shake everything that needed to be shaken. This shaking mm -hmm. that's taken place, there's a lot of it that had to take place. And so, Lord, we just say, well, shake what needs to be shaken. But, Lord, we humble ourselves, we submit unto you. And, Lord, we just cry out that the world cries out, that they recognize that they need a Savior. And God, that they just yield and surrender, but deception, the veils, the scales are removed. We decree it. We know that the God of this age is blinded eyes, but we say now in Jesus' name, eyes open in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, listen, this has been awesome. And uh, thank you for your time. We we're just, like Peter said, we're honored to have you guys on, and uh, we look forward to seeing you in the future. So, yes. amen. Thank you so much for having us on tonight. Yeah. Amen. Love you guys. All right. Love you. Have a good, good night. night.